invite you to turn with me now in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 17th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 17, we'll be reading verses 1 through 9 this morning. Matthew chapter 17, beginning there with verse 1. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. <coughs> May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Will you pray with me? And now, O oh God, we ask for ears to hear, ears that hear your words, not whatever words I put in the way, eyes to see your way before us, hands and feet, Lord, faithful to follow, hearts open to receive, hearts open to give. Be with us, Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We were just four sort of bumbling, self-proclaimed preacher boys in college. More of us had gone up, but four was all that we could fit in Andrew's Honda Accord at the time. We were coming down I-65. I don't remember what we were talking about, probably bragging about who preached the longest, as if that was the measure of what makes a good sermon. And as we were going along, there on the right-hand side was one of those brown signs advertising a roadside attraction or a state park, the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament. Sounded really interesting. Some of you probably heard me talk about it before as we were going along. We all decided, you got anything you got to be back to campus for? No. You got anything you got to be back to campus for? No. Well, let's go find out what this is about. Now, this was in the day before you could pull your computer out of your pocket and put in how far it would take, how long it would take to get from where you are to where the shrine of the most blessed sacrament was. It turned out it was about the longest hour I had ever experienced in my life. We followed the signs into downtown Coleman, a place I hadn't been before. And as we were driving, I noticed if you've been there, a tall, twin-spired Catholic church. We kept driving on, went through some residential places, uh, passed a few trailers along the way, and then all of a sudden, as if we had slipped through a crack in space-time itself, the, the way just opened onto rolling green pastures. And it was beautiful. We kept driving, and we came to a gate, a big steel gate, and I want to say angels flanking it on either side, and on the left-hand side of the road was a replica of Michael's Pieta, the Virgin Mary holding the deceased body of Christ. As we drove through the gate, we kept going, and it loomed there in front of us, the shrine, the church. Mother Angelica, who you've probably heard of, she was on television for a while, built this church out there, a sort of convent out in Coleman. I later learned Coleman has the highest population of Roman Catholics in all of Alabama, right along with the highest population of Klansmen. I don't know what that means, but we were there. We pulled into the parking lot and followed a few stragglers up the stairs and through these heavy doors of this place, and I was awestruck. 
You see, the four of us had just come from preaching in small Southern Baptist churches all over North Alabama. I think mine had a ceiling fan over the pulpit. Someone's had a screen door on the front. Still others had no air conditioning, had to open the windows just to get air moving. And here we were in this grand cathedral in the middle of nowhere. We walked in dark hardwood everywhere, marble on the floor, gold pipes, statues. It was beautiful, stained glass. And we walked around like we were tourists in a foreign land, our necks craned up, looking at everything, trying to figure out the Latin on the walls as if we really knew what it was. Looking at the stained glass, following the stations of the cross. And then all of a sudden, as if, as if God had turned on the radio, we started to hear voices. The nuns were singing. We don't know where they were. I still don't know. They still, it could have been a recording, and they just had way better sound equipment than I was used to. But we heard them sing, and so we sat down on the pew as if they were giving a concert just for us, and we listened. We couldn't understand it. Most of it was hymns in Latin. We sat and we listened. And I started to look around. There weren't that many people there. I, it had jogged my memory. We weren't just here on a Tuesday passing through. This was Sunday afternoon. The Lord's Day for worship. And here we were like tourists sitting down, admiring the gold and the stone, and sprinkled among the pews were several older women with their heads covered and their heads bowed, praying. We walked out. There was a grotto carved into the hillside of the nativity, a small castle that was locked. We later found out was, of all things, the gift shop. But we walked back to the car, and as Andrew put the key in the ignition and started it up, I said to them, how are we ever going to go back to preaching in those little podunk churches after what we've seen today? But we did. It's easy, I think, to get caught up in the grandeur of the moment, of the, the beauty of everything that is there. But there's more to it than that. Because in the middle of all that art, in the middle of all that beauty, people were praying. And God was present. In this passage of scripture we've read together today, something grand, something wonderful, something mysterious happens. Six days before this scene on the mountain, though, Jesus told his disciples the truth about where all of this was going to wind up. Jesus, Matthew says, just a few verses before in chapter 16, began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. But Peter, who always seems to stick his foot in his mouth in Matthew's gospel, uh, tells Jesus, hey, ain't never going to happen, bud. Not on my watch. This is not going to happen. And Jesus, in Matthew's gospel, rebukes Peter, even calls him Satan. Jesus tells of the necessity of his followers' self-denial. How if they wish, if you wish to be my followers, Jesus says, you must give yourself up, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Presumably not on the way to the gift exchange, but to the place where they nail you to the cross to die. And then six days later, this scene we've read today takes place. Matthew says Jesus just took three with him. That's often the formula in the Gospels. Jesus doesn't take the whole group. Maybe he doesn't have enough room in the car. I don't know, but he only takes three with him. And it's usually Peter, James, and James' brother John. And he led them up a high mountain by themselves where he was transfigured. When Nikki asked the kids this morning, what does that mean? I wanted to say, I don't know. Transfigured? He was transformed? Before them, his face shone like the sun, his clothes became dazzling white, and who should happen to appear but Moses and Elijah standing and talking with Jesus. Now try just for a minute in your mind's eye to pretend, to, to think about this. If you were Peter, James, or John witnessing this, Jesus has just taken you up a mountain. Now in, in, we've been listening in Matthew's gospel to when Jesus was on a different mountain where he went by himself and preached, but now he's taking 
James, Peter, and John. He sounds a bit like Moses with this infatuation about mountains. It's not a surprise given Matthew's gospel and his affinity for Moses. And it's just you and the other two disciples. The rest of the disciples are presumably down on the bottom of the mountain. Maybe they've ran out to go get some more loaves and fishes. I don't know. But there they are. And when you reach the top, suddenly Jesus morphs right before your eyes. No longer the dark-skinned Near Easterner that Hollywood seems to never portray. He's no longer the man who's been walking with you on the shores of Lake Galilee or broken bread with you at the dinner table. Now he's transformed, transfigured into something all entirely different, some luminous, divine person with a solar-powered complexion and clothes so bright they dazzle in the daylight. And as if that weren't enough, as if that weren't enough to make you go, what is happening? Moses and Elijah, who are so clearly Moses and Elijah that even though they're thousands of years apart, you know who they are. Moses and Elijah show up. The embodiment of the law and the symbolic prophet appear. And Jesus just strikes up a conversation with them. How's your mom and them, Elijah? Oh, how you doing, Jesus? Just starts talking to them. About only God knows what. What would you do if that happened? What would you do? Would you run screaming back down the mountain? Y'all, Jesus is glowing. What would you do? Two men just appeared out of nowhere, and Jesus is talking to them like he knows them. What would you do? The man who just told you that he was going to die and rise again... The man that, at this point, you've seen feed thousands of people from a kid's sack lunch has suddenly taken on an appearance that can only be described as divine, and he's carrying on a conversation with two of the biggest heroes of your faith and ancestral history as if he's known them forever. What do you do? In a moment like that, it would be easy to get caught up in it, to get caught up in what's happening right in front of you. In a moment like that, perhaps you'd want time to just stand still so that you could be in the presence of these three men for as long as possible. If we could just stop everything right now and be with this transfigured Christ in Moses and Elijah. In a moment like that, maybe you'd want to break out a quill and parchment, and start asking for autographs. I thought about this morning as I was getting ready. Cole found his autograph book from Disney World. Wouldn't that be something you do? Was that Moses? Is that Elijah? Can I, can I get you? They're never going to believe me. Well, Peter does one better. Peter says to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish... I will make three dwellings here, three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Where's he getting the stuff from is what I want to know. He doesn't think about it. Peter never thinks about it. He just jumps right in. I'll build three tents right now. He doesn't want autographs. He doesn't want a picture. No selfie with Elijah. Nothing with the Son of Man and these two saints of old. Peter wants to build three tabernacles, three chapels. One for each of them, so they can stay on the mountain. So they can keep this holy thing happening and going on for as long as they all can stand it. I mean, think about what Peter says. He says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. He never said that when they were walking in Nazareth. He never said that after they had broken the bread and passed it and fed thousands of people. Lord, it's good for us to be here. Here, in the midst of the need, in the midst of the hurt, in the midst of... No, it's good for us to be here, where nobody's bothering us, where you and the law and the prophets are present. It's good for us to be here. It's good for us to be on this mountain, in this moment, in the midst of all this great and wonderful holiness. It's good to be in the middle of a chapel, gold gilded, marble plated, everything nice and wonderful. It's good to be in that moment when it's all so righteous and holy, in the midst of the spectacle. But just just as Peter says this, something happens. 
God cuts him off. It's good for us to be here. And then a cloud comes. Right as Peter was professing his desire to build these three tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah, God interrupts. Because right here in the midst of what we call a Christophany, this revelation of who Jesus is, there's a theophany, an appearance of God. Right in the middle of it. Matthew tells us, while Peter was still speaking, suddenly a, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my Son, the Beloved. With Him I am well pleased. Listen to Him. While Peter and Presumably James and John are, are enthralled by Jesus' transfiguration, caught up in this moment where Jesus is glowing and talking to Moses and Elijah. The voice of God Almighty interrupts Peter's grandstanding in order to tell him and those who are with him, listen to Jesus. Peter wants to build monuments. Peter wants to commemorate the moment recognize the importance of what is taking place. Peter wants the visible wonder of the transfiguration to endure. He never wants this mountaintop experience to end. But God, God has to upturn Peter's expectations. He has to disrupt Peter out of this self-involved attempt at recognizing what's taking place on the mountain. It's not that, oh, look how holy, look how wonderful, look how dazzling this is. God says, here's the point. Listen to him. Such a thunderous interruption from the midst of this bright cloud and still such fear in these three disciples that they seem to be pe petrified, incapable of standing on their feet. They fall to the ground, listen to him, and they just hit the ground, frightened. Now, I used to think that was because, well, I'd be scared, too, if, if a cloud came down on me and a voice came out of that cloud talking to me. But I think what petrifies them is what the cloud says. Listen to him. What does he say? What had he just said to them all down at the, end, at the bottom of the mountain? If you want to be my followers, you have to deny yourselves. Take up your cross and follow me. And now an obviously divine voice from the cloud says, listen to him. That's scary. It's only when they hear the familiar voice of Jesus. As he comes over, I'm assuming, maybe touches them on the shoulder and says, get up and do not be afraid. Don't, it's not, don't be afraid of the cloud. Don't be afraid of what's coming. Don't be afraid to leave this mountain. Don't be afraid to listen to my words and take up your cross and follow me. They rise to their feet. They descend down the mountain where Jesus invokes what we call the messianic secret. And he tells Peter, James, and John, now listen, don't tell anybody about what you saw. They told somebody because we've got it, right? They had to come down from the mountain. They had to face the world. The reality of life on the ground. They had to leave behind any thoughts about building tabernacles in an attempt to prolong their spiritual high. They had to come down and they had to listen to Jesus. And friends, sometimes we can get up on the mountain. And we can get up on the mountain and think, boy, this is wonderful, this is great. I don't ever want this to end. We can have times in our lives when we feel like you've heard me say, we're on a gravy train with biscuit wheels. Everything is wonderful. Everything is great. We're on this high. We want it to last as long as we can. And then Jesus says, come on off the mountain. There's work to do. Friends, we have to come down from the mountain sometimes. We have to face the reality of life as it is on the ground, outside of ourselves, the reality of our lives and the lives of those around us. We have to leave behind any thoughts about constructing our own tabernacles, building our own boxes in which we keep the Almighty. We've got to move beyond the memories of spiritual highs that keep us tethered to the past. We have to listen to Jesus. For too often on days like this, on Transfiguration Sunday, we, we look around and we might want to say, 
Lord, it is good for us to be here. It is good for us to be here in this moment, in this time, where we don't have to listen to the news, when we don't have to worry about what's on, going on in the world, we don't have to watch it on TV or hear it on the radio. It is good for us to be here. We hear songs that we like. We see people we like. We get a feeling of joy and comfort, and so many of us, we want to keep it going for ourselves, and I can't blame, can't blame us. It's hard out there. It's tough out there. I don't want to come down from the mountain. I get why Peter wants to build a tabernacle. It's hard down, on the, down from the mountain. But that's what he calls us to do. We want to stay up on the mountain. Lord, it's good for us to be here, but life is not lived up on the mountain. Life is lived down in the presence of a Jesus that is soft and not in the presence of a Jesus that is soft and predictable. But in the messy presence of a Christ who calls us to come and follow me. And friends, I'm going to tell you, I don't always know where he's going. But I know he calls me to follow. This Jesus meets us on the ground, not up in the clouds. To put this maybe in a more tangible, realistic way of thinking about it, while it's good for us to be here in this room on the Lord's Day for worship, while it is good for us to be here together to listen to Scripture, to pray together on Sunday and Wednesdays, while it is good for us to be here in this place where we meet God, God is still disrupting our desire to stay cloistered beneath steeples, hidden behind walls and disguised by doctrines. God is still telling us, Listen to Jesus. And just as it was frightening for those disciples, it's frightening for me. Because sometimes I listen to Jesus. And Jesus tells me to do something I know is not going to go over well. Sometimes I listen to Jesus and he says something to me that I, I, I don't want any part of. Because I want to stay on the mountain. I want to build the tabernacle. I want to sing the hymns. I don't want to go... Do the messy stuff, Jesus. But God still tells us to listen. And Jesus has an awful lot to say. Words that shake us, words that call us, words that disrupt our comfort and complacency to stay up on the mountain. Jesus is still speaking. Sometimes unexpectedly. Sometimes words that are unexpected. Calling us to places unexpected. Jesus is calling every one of us to step outside of what we feel is comfortable, to understand that there's more to faith than hunkering down in the ways we've always felt safe, more than finding our little tents on the top of the mountain. Jesus is calling each and every one of us to undo the misguided notion that the only place to see the fullness of Christ is on a mountaintop, that the only way to have church is inside the four walls of a steepled building. Jesus is calling us to follow him and folks, Jesus, Jesus, as we like to say, he ain't always at the meeting house. He's not always on the mountaintop. If Matthew's telling of Jesus' transfiguration tells us anything, I think it's this, that while it may be good for us to be here, and friends, it is good for us to be here, whether it's in this room, in this time, or in this place in your life, it's good. But Jesus isn't calling us to stay here. While the predictable piety of grand religion may be a place of comfort, Jesus is unpredictable, calling us out of the euphoria of whatever it is that's rocked us to sleep and calls us into the messy disruption of the cross. How fitting, I think, it is to hear those words at the threshold of Lent, to know that we're coming now out of a season when we Think about Christ's birth and epiphany. And now here we are at the doorway to the season where we must think about the hard words of Jesus. To a season that will bring us right up to the cross and the very death of God in Christ. How fitting it is to hear those words. Listen to him. And come off the mountain. It won't be what you expect, but that's the gift 
the gift of the unexpected you. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we come now, Lord, we confess it is good to be here. It is good for us to be here among one another, among friends, among family, among those we love. It is good for us to be here in a time that we set aside to be with one another and to focus our attention on you. But Lord, we know you call us to listen to Christ. And Christ doesn't stay here in this place, in this hour, among us alone. So Lord, help us to come down from the mountain, to go out into the places you call us, whether they be expected, and Lord, if they are truly unexpected. Call us, even now, and help us to hear your voice, to listen and respond. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.